the figure of the Messiah, integral to both Jewish and Christian eschatologies, has evolved throughout the centuries. This journey from the first glimmers in our earliest text to the multifaceted concept that we see in later writings reflects a fascinating transformation. Yet many who seek to answer the question of who the Messiah is have bypassed a crucial step, and that is understanding what the origins of the Messiah were. Join me as we delve into this often overlooked aspect, unraveling the original essence of Messiah. We'll explore key passages within the Pentateuch, tracing the evolution of the term and the concept that it embodies. Now, let's embark on this journey together in Messiah Origins of the Anointed. The Hebrew Mashiach, or Messiah, and its Greek counterpart, Christos, or Christ, both mean the same thing. A lot of times people separate the two, but both terms, Messiah and Christ, both mean anointed. That's what we're going to talk about today. Jews and Hebraically oriented types favor the term Messiah. Christians, because of the New Testament, often favor the term Christ. It's the term that they're familiar with. But both of these terms, Messiah and Christ, have come to define almost exclusively today a chief redemptive figure anticipated to bring about a coming glorious golden age. Both groups, Jews and Christians, who look to these terms and and study the concept of the Messiah or the Christ, while they disagree on the identity, on who this Messiah is, was, or will be, they both appeal to the same text. They both appeal to the text of the Hebrew Bible for their understanding of the Messiah and the role of the Messiah. Now, Scripture presents a complex picture of the Messiah. It's rich, it's varied. There's quite a bit in the Hebrew Bible that are termed messianic texts. They apply in most people's eschatology to the coming of the Messiah. Rabbinic literature is very much into this varied and rich picture of the Messiah, the complexity, if you will. But other ancient texts are as well. We see the complexity brought forth in the text from Qumran. And even though the New Testament is often thought of as pointing only to Jesus as the anointed one, the complexity is right there under the surface. For instance, in some of this ancient literature, questions began to be brought forward to the surface in antiquity. Would there be one Messiah? or two messiahs, or more? Would the messiah suffer, or would the messiah be the conquering king? Now, a lot of times in the Jewish circles today, or in those who reject the Christian message and reject the New Testament, often it's not considered that there is an ancient view that surfaces in these documents about a suffering messiah, if you will. For instance, in the, in the Talmud, there's mention of the leper scholar where the, the sages are debating whether or not Isaiah 53 talks about a suffering Messiah or not. Now, the word Messiah doesn't appear in that text, as you know, but nonetheless, the concept is there, even if it's not so much talked about today in those circles. But part of that is because it's a response to the Christian claims. So, those sorts of things are pushed out of the picture. But again, it's a very rich and varied picture. We have multiple uh, pictures of the Messiah, if you will, from these ancient texts. But what I want to talk about today particularly is how the view of the Messiah evolved over time. 
And we see signs of this apart from the New Testament, apart from rabbinic literature. We see this evolution of ideas even in the Hebrew Bible, and that's going to be the focus that we're talking about today. If we were to do a survey of the use of the word mashak, the Hebrew word mashak, the root word throughout the Hebrew Bible, we would see that the idea of being anointed is, in fact, the root meaning, but we see it develop further and further as we get into the text. Once we leave the Pentateuch and we get into the prophets and the writings, we see a full-blown development of this idea. Things that aren't mentioned in the Pentateuch become the focus of the idea, the concept of Messiah. We want to go back, but before we do, let's consider the example of the king. Now, I recently did a class on God forsaken, a king like the nations. If most people will look up the term Messiah, what they'll find in most standard biblical dictionaries and so forth is they're going to find that king... Melech figures in in almost every definition of the Messiah. But that only comes in in Judges chapter 9. Before Judges chapter 9, there is no mention of an anointed king, a Melech who has been anointed. That only comes in in Judges 9. In Judges chapter 9, there is an ancient parable and it's really a piece of anti-monarchy literature. It's very critical of the king. But as time went on, the idea, the acceptance of the monarchy, the acceptance of the king, and the anointing of this office, as we say, the rest is history. But for the present study, I'm not so concerned with views of the Messiah outside of the Pentateuch. Because remember, what we really want to do is go back to the origins of the anointed. I'm not as concerned with how this developed through history. It is a rich and full development. It is an evolution of the idea. We're going to really focus in this class on the origins of that idea. But I do want to say that if although we're focusing in this particular class on the Pentateuch, referred to as the Torah by Orthodox, and also I want to think about this as these texts are presented as our earliest sources. The five books are presented as the foundational documents from which all the ideas in biblical literature spring. I'm also not truly interested in later interpretive ideas, but there are quite a few, and even if we focus on the Pentateuch, the text of the Pentateuch, we see the development of some of these interpretations. Most of us are familiar with the passage in Genesis chapter uh, 49, in Genesis chapter 49. Now, translations take this in a lot of different directions. But if we look at Genesis 49, these are the blessings of or the prophecies over the tribes of Israel uh, by Jacob. And in this particular passage in Genesis 49, it says, The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. Now, that's the New American Standard. Other translations read differently. But what is being picked up on here, in the Hebrew, it says, Adki Yavo Shilo. Adki Yavo Shilo. Now, most people, many commentators, both Jewish and Christian, looked at this particular text as a messianic text. And so Shiloh, or Shiloh, became one of the designations, one of the interpretive names of a coming Messiah. Be that as it may, we're not going deeply into these interpretive models. There's another text that most people associate from the Pentateuch with a messianic figure. 
If you look at chapter 24, the book of Numbers, Numbers 24 and verse 17, uh, these words were spoken by Balaam, Balaam, a prophet, not an Israelite prophet, a pagan prophet, if you will, and he says this, I see him, but not now. I look at him, but not near. A star shall appear from Jacob. A scepter shall rise from Israel and shall smash the forehead of Moab and overcome all the sons of Sheth. Now, this particular phrase, a scepter and a star, both of these become synonymous with the Messiah. They're understood to, re, to, to look forward to a coming messianic figure, and therefore, in most charts, if you look at charts of messianic passages in the Pentateuch, Numbers 24, 17 will clearly be listed. It is interesting. It is a fascinating passage. Uh, Bilam says, I see him, Veloata, not now. So Bilam is looking into the future and he sees this victorious one who rises from the ranks of Israel. Christians, too, find ways to find the Messiah in the Pentateuch. And these are quite likely based on uh, words, at least in the writings of the New Testament, attributed to Jesus. For instance, in the Gospel of John, and by the way, most of these are from the Gospel of John, <clears throat> but in John chapter 5 and verse 46, Jesus says that Moses wrote of him. Now, he doesn't share with the reader what exactly he means by that, but he does suggest or the writer of John's gospel suggests that Jesus said that Moses wrote of him. Also, Luke's gospel. In Luke's gospel, it says that Jesus began on the road to uh, Emmaus. It says in Luke chapter 24 that beginning at Moses, he expounded unto those who were on that path all the things written in the law of Moses concerning him. Again, Luke's gospel, just like John's gospel, makes reference, pointing the reader to the Pentateuch without telling us what exactly the references in Moses or in the law of Moses are that the writer wants us to identify with Jesus of Nazareth. In fact, I should add that there are really only two. Now, there are other allusions, but there are only two direct references put into the mouth of Jesus and the Gospels where he says that this in the law of Moses speaks of me. And those two references are, interestingly enough, the serpent and the bread. You remember in John chapter 3, in John chapter 3, according to the Gospel of John, red-lettered, Jesus says, as Moses lifted the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted. I remember years ago when I first saw that, the first thing I wanted to do was go back and study that story and see if there were connections that weren't so obvious on the surface. We know the basic story. We know the basic story. It comes from the book of Numbers, Bamidbar in the Torah. In the story in Numbers chapter 21, those who have rebelled against Moses and those who have rebelled against God are bitten by serpents. And so Moses is instructed to make a seraph. He makes a nachash, puts that upon a ness or a banner, and he raises it up. And all the ones who were bitten, when they looked upon this, they were healed. All right? Now, that's an interesting story. And I should point out that those who did not rebel against Moses, those who did not rebel against God, weren't bitten. And therefore, they need not look upon this thing that Moses made. Now, the second reference that the Gospel of John wants us to know is pointing to Jesus is the bread that came down from heaven that sustained the children of Israel, Exodus chapter 16 and elsewhere. But what I find fascinating and what many people fail to do, particularly Christians, is to think the story through. 
So for instance, if the Jesus of the gospel says that that story points to me, let's look at it all the way through quickly. If you go to 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 18, in 2 Kings 18, I just want to read verse 4. Now, we're in the time of Hezekiah. So this is talking about the reign of Hezekiah. It says that he, Hezekiah, removed the high places and smashed the memorial stones to pieces and cut down the Asherah. He also crushed to pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the sons of Israel had been burning incense to it, and it was called Nehushtan. Interestingly enough, the very story which Jesus points his followers to in the Torah refers to this story in Numbers chapter 21, but the rest of the story is that ultimately the object that brought life was worshipped, and it had to be destroyed. The second instance that Jesus points to in the law of Moses is the bread, now, what I find fascinating, and I don't really know what it means, is that in Numbers chapter 21, the same chapter that refers to the serpent, it mentions that the children of Israel began to loathe the very bread that had sustained them. I leave it to the viewer to consider the meaning of the only two references in the Gospels that Jesus directly applies to himself. One became an idol, and the second ultimately was loathed. But my focus is not on interpreting these texts about Messiah and finding the Messiah in allusions in the Pentateuch. I want a more direct approach. I want to deal specifically with the word, with the, the root word mashak because it's from Meshach that we get all of the references, all that we know for certain about Messiah, Meshach. Again, it means anointed, so we're going to begin, but we're going to mainly focus on text from the Pentateuch. And in the Pentateuch, this particular word Meshach, in all its forms, occurs 51 times. From Genesis, we get references. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, oddly enough, Deuteronomy doesn't use the word a single time. But in the priestly literature of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, we do find this idea of Meshach. Now, I want to take us to the first occurrence of the word Meshach. Go with me to Genesis chapter 31. This is the first use of the word that means anointed. Genesis 31, and I just want to pick up the verse uh, that mentions it specifically, and that would be verse 13. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed the memorial stone, where you made a vow to me. Now arise, leave this land, and return to the land of your birth. This particular passage, Genesis 31, 13, it's, it uses the word anoint, and it's referring back to a story that previously happened. So we're going to go back to that story now, because here it doesn't describe what it means to anoint. It simply makes reference to an earlier anointing that Jacob performed. So we're going to go back to Genesis chapter 28. In Genesis chapter 28, uh, we know the story. In Genesis chapter 28, Jacob is fleeing from his brother Esau. Now, this particular story happens to be part of, it begins in verse 10, the story that is in Torah reading or the annual Torah cycle reading of Vayetze, and Jacob went forth. So I'm going to begin, though, in verse 11. Genesis 28, verse 11. And he happened upon a particular place, being Jacob, and spent the night there because the sun had set. 
He took one of the stones of the place and he made it a support for his head. And he lay down in that place and he had a dream. And behold, a ladder was set up on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Then behold, the Lord standing above it. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of your father Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your descendants. Your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth. You will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go, will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. So this is presented as a dream. Jacob, fleeing from his brother, puts his head on a stone and sleeps. And in his dream, he sees a, the Hebrew uses sulam, it's a ladder, a staircase. And at the very top, God is standing there. Messengers are ascending and descending. God tells him this prophetic message about his descendants. Now, I want you to look now at verse 16. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, this is Genesis 28, 16. The Lord is certainly in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid, and he said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. So Jacob got up early in the morning, took the stone that he had placed as a support for his head, and set it up as a memorial stone and poured oil on its top. Then he named that place Bethel, but previously the name of the city had been Luz. Jacob also made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me on this journey that I take and give me food to eat and garments to wear, and I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone which I have set up as a memorial stone will be God's house. And of everything that you give me, I will surely give a tenth. To you. Now, interestingly enough, in verse 18 and verse 22 of this particular passage, it mentions a sacred pillar. This is the pillar that Jacob rested his head on. This is the pillar that Jacob stands up and pours oil upon. He anoints this pillar. In Hebrew, the word for memorial stone from this translation, or a pillar, is matseva, a matseva. We also get this in Genesis chapter 35. Uh, there's a section in Genesis 35, verses 9 through 15, where we have another episode. Verse 14, Jacob sets up another pillar of stone, and he pours oil on it. Now, this is interesting. This Taking a matseva and putting oil on it is interesting for this reason, because later in the Bible, this becomes forbidden. Now, we do know also that Moses does the same thing according to the priestly writing of Exodus chapter 24. But in Leviticus chapter 26 and 1 and Deuteronomy chapter 16 and verse 22, this is forbidden later according to Hebrew law. I want to look at, let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 16 and verse 22. Again, also Leviticus chapter 26 verse 1, but this is Deuteronomy 16 verse 22. You shall not set up for yourself a matseva, a matseva, which the Lord your God hates. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, God didn't say anything to Jacob, but we do have examples in patriarchal narratives where some uh, religious thing that they take and do is uh, later forbidden. You know, you can't marry sisters later in the Pentateuch, but at the patriarchal times, it seems to not be uh, a law. So, the sacred pillars become forbidden. 
But this sacred pillar is the very first instance of anointing in the Pentateuch. And if you recognize what's going on here, the way that the anointing takes place is that oil is poured on the top of it. He's identified this as a sacred place. So the connection is oil poured on top of a sacred place is anointing. Now, back to the sacred pillars. Later, the Israelites are told to destroy the sacred pillars of others. And those passages are Exodus chapter 23, verse 24, chapter 34 of Exodus, verse 13, chapter Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 5, and Deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse 3. This pillar in Genesis chapter 28 and Genesis chapter 31, where it refers back to the incident in chapter 28 at Bethel, is in fact the first anointed thing. Biblically speaking, the stone is the first Messiah of the Bible, if you understand that Messiah means anointed. Now, Exodus chapter 25 introduces us to the tabernacle and all that is associated therewith. If you look at chapter 25 of the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 25 and verse 8, Exodus 25 verse 8 and 9 says, have them construct a sanctuary for me. In Hebrew, it's a mikdash. Have them construct a sanctuary for me so that I may dwell among them or dwell in their midst. According to all that I'm going to show you as the pattern, the tavnit of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furniture, so you shall construct it. Now, this particular text sets the stage for quite a bit that follows associated with the tabernacle. The tabernacle basically runs, the text focuses on the tabernacle from Exodus chapter 25 through most of the book of Numbers, probably at least until the 11th chapter of the book of Numbers. Now, but the anointing plays a central role in the narrative sections concerning the tabernacle. And this requires that there be a special oil with which to anoint everything associated with the tabernacle. So let's read that. Go with me to the book of Exodus chapter 30. Exodus chapter 30, beginning in verse 22. In Exodus 30, verse 22, it says, And moreover, the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Take also for yourself the finest of spices, liquid myrrh, 500 shekels, fragrant cinnamon, half as much, 250, and of fragrant cane, 250, and of cassia, 500, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, and of olive oil, a hen. You shall make from these a holy anointing oil, a fragrant mixture of ointments, the work of a perfumer. It shall be a holy anointing oil. And you shall anoint the tent of meaning with it and the ark of the testimony, as the translation says, and the table and all its utensils and the lampstand and its utensils and the altar of incense and the altar of burnt offering and all its utensils and the basin and its stand. You shall also consecrate them so that they may be most holy. Whatever touches them shall be holy. And you shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them so that they may serve as priest to me. So all that is anointed biblically, all upon which the anointing oil described here in Exodus 30 and elsewhere, all that is, the oil is poured upon is anointed. And all that is anointed by the oil is set apart for a sacred purpose. It's designated for something holy. This oil is not to be used on objects that aren't associated with the sanctity that's described pertaining to the Mishkan, the Mikdash. But everything, as we work through the text, beginning in Exodus chapter 25, 
we get various things which are anointed. For instance, Exodus chapter 29 and verse 2, Leviticus chapter 2 and verse 4, and chapter 7 and verse 12 talk about wafers, crackers upon which oil is poured. These crackers, biblically speaking, are anointed. Wafers that are anointed. These, in some way, and I'm not being silly, are Messiah crackers. It is something which is anointed. The same goes for the altar. The altar in chapter 29, verse 36 of Exodus, chapter 40 and verse 10 of Exodus, and Leviticus chapter 8 and verse 11, all describe the anointing, the pouring of oil upon the altar, making the altar anointed. It is, in some ways, an anointed object. It becomes an object, a Messiah. The same goes for the tent and the chest of the testimony or the, the ark of the testimony, as most translations put it. Again, Exodus chapter 30 and verse 26 deals with the anointing of the ark. Chapter 40 and verse 9 in chapter uh, 8, verse 10 of Leviticus. In fact, let's look at Leviticus chapter 8 and verse 10. Leviticus chapter 8 and verse 10. And it says, Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and everything that was in it and consecrated them. By the way, the Hebrew there is made holy. The root word there is uh, kadosh. Uh, and anointed the tabernacle, everything that was in it, consecrated them. He also sprinkled some of it on the altar seven times and anointed the altar and all its utensils, and the basin and its stand, to consecrate them. Then he poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him. Next, Moses had Aaron's sons come near, and he clothed them with tunics and wrapped their waist with sashes and bound caps on them as the Lord had commanded Moses. So what we get in Leviticus chapter 8, verse 10 through 13, is that the objects as well as Moses and his son are anointed for a sacred purpose, for a special purpose associated with the worship of God they are, biblically speaking, messiahs. Now, one thing to make very clear, so far as the Pentateuch, so far as the five books of Moses, traditionally known as the Torah, according to these texts, there is no human messiah other than the priest. It's always, without exception, a priest, a son of Aaron, who is the Messiah, who is the anointed, and never the word Melech, never a king. Again, no exception. Exodus chapter 28, verse 41. All of these deal with the priesthood representing the Messiah of the Pentateuch. Exodus 29, verse 7. Verse 29 of Exodus 29. Exodus chapter 30, verse 30. Exodus chapter 40, verses 12 through 15. Leviticus 8, 30. Uh, Leviticus 10, verse 7. It's always the priest, Aaron and his sons. I want you to look with me at Psalm 133. Psalm 133. This is another picture of the anointing. Psalm 133 says the following. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard, on Aaron's beard, the oil which ran down upon the edges of his robe. So this is describing the anointing of Aaron the making of a Messiah. The oil was poured upon Aaron's head and it flowed down, so it's not just a drop, 
it flowed down upon his beard and on the edges of his robe. On his robe. The priest or the Messiah of the Pentateuch. Now, a lot of people know that when we talk about Messiah, I often get this question. People will say, yes, Ross, I understand that those objects are anointed things. But I want to know about the Messiah. And quite often, if they know any Hebrew at all, they'll say, I'm talking about Hamashiach, the Messiah. What's interesting that that comes up, and it comes up pretty frequently, because Hamashiach, the Messiah, is only used four times in all of the Hebrew Bible. Four times. All four occur in the book of Leviticus. These are the references. Leviticus chapter 4 and verse 3. Leviticus chapter 4 and verse 5. Chapter 4 and verse 16 of Leviticus. So in other words, three of the four which use Hamashiach are in Leviticus chapter 4. I tell people, this is the most anointed chapter in all the Bible. If you understand, Hamashiach means the anointed. And then the final reference is also in Leviticus, but it's in Leviticus chapter 6 and verse 22. Or if you're using a Hebrew Bible, it's verse 15 in the Hebrew, chapter 6. In each of these passages, it says Hamashiach, and only here. But it's using Hamashiach as the anointed as an adjective. So in other words, it says Hamashiach, but it's associated with Hakohen, the priest. So really what it's saying is the priest that's anointed or the anointed priest. Again, the Messiah, Hamashiach of the Pentateuch, if you want to talk about a human Messiah, is always a priest, never anyone else, never anything else. In terms of an object, we get wafers. We get uh, all the furniture that's associated with the tabernacle, the tabernacle itself, the Ark of the Covenant. All of these things, biblically, are messiahs. All of these things, biblically, are messiahs. So then, what can we take away from a careful survey of the anointing as it is presented in the Pentateuch. Anointing is when oil, in the case from Exodus 25 forward, it's a specially prepared anointing oil, but it's when oil is poured upon, sometimes smeared upon, an object, and this object or this person is set apart, the pouring of the oil, the, anoint, the actual anointing of the object or the person sets that object or person apart for sacred use. Now, over time, the idea of the anointing evolved. In some ways, in many ways, it evolved away from the original idea. As I talked about the idea evolved, particularly from Judges chapter 9, almost exclusively from Judges chapter 9, the Messiah is a king. And we do get, by the way, we do get in Zechariah and other passages about an anointed priest, and we do know in other passages of the Bible that priests are still anointed, but the focus clearly shifts. But these examples... These examples that I've given today represent the origin of the anointing. So I want to give you an example in visual. This is oil. If I take this oil and I pour this oil on top of something, in this case, on top of my desk, biblically, I made a Messiah. If I take this oil, 
and I were to rub it on an object, on my Bible, let's say, I anointed that Bible. These objects become anointed things. If this oil, if I took this oil and I poured it upon my head, I'm not because I know how you are. Some of you would take this video clip, spread it around the globe, and say that Ross said he was the Messiah. I just want you to understand the point. So I'm not going to do it. Maybe I should, but I'm not. But this is the making of an anointed. I can anoint my notes. I can anoint my desk. I can anoint my chair. These examples serve to illustrate the biblical idea of the making of a Messiah and represent the origins of the anointed.